Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, second uh, conference uh, of the Wright Foundation, which is the second one uh, this year. Now, you know we're taking uh, this meeting in very special circumstances because there's no public because of COVID-19. Normally, there should be 600 people in this uh, auditorium. I hope that there are going to be even more of you behind your computer screens. Yesterday, we managed uh, to get so many people that it overloaded our computer servers. Let's hope that everything go, will go uh, well. My, uh, I am Director of Scientific Communication for Geneva Science uh, Foundation, which is uh, there to promote uh, scientific uh, diplomacy. I will be with you today and tomorrow and guide you through this symposium. As every year, we have the privilege to welcome here to Geneva virtually great uh, speakers, people of great renown. And we're going to be talking about mathematics. And uh, with the lecturers, we're going to be taken to not into the kind of mathematics we learned at school. Blaise Pascal in uh, the 17th century said, life is good to, to study and to teach mathematics. Now, I don't know if the prestigious speakers will confirm uh, the veracity of this, but what is sure is that they're going to take us on a journey and to try and to, to be as uh, concrete as possible. And uh, to speak of Ernest Renan, the historian of uh, mathematics, has said uh, that mathematics was uh, the realm of uh, things that are unchanging. As usual, we're going to have two parts. The first is going to be with a lecture, which will take place in a few moments. And then there's going to be a question and answer session. This is going to be done entirely online this year. You will have an opportunity to ask your questions, and you can ask your questions uh, during uh, the conference itself on the internet site. You should have a little white uh, screen next to the video, which is uh, broadcasting uh, the conference, just to type your question in. And uh, if you're following us on Facebook Live, I would suggest you go to the colloquium, uh, which is colloquium.ch, uh, C-O-L-L-O-Q-U-E dot C-H. The questions will be uh, redistributed, uh, or uh, we will pass them on to the speaker this evening. But before we go into the nitty-gritty, let me give the floor to Thierry uh, Corbusier, who is president of the Route Foundation, and it is under his patronage that uh, this colloquium is taking place. This is one of the most important foundations in Switzerland, and it is uh, one which promotes uh, a dialogue between the world of science and society. Welcome on behalf of the Rauter Foundation, and it is uh, with pleasure that we welcome you here. I think it is a uh, even more important than ever before that we have conferences of this uh, nature during this period. I hope uh, that you're well installed behind your screen. Perhaps you'll have a glass in your hands and that you're seated comfortably. Now, we had a bit of technical problems yesterday in spite of the very careful preparation of our teams, but it didn't prevent us uh, from listening to a very interesting conference. And some of them, uh, some of you who could not follow this uh, live were able to follow us on the colloquium's website. Let us hope uh, that the work done by our technicians, and I'd like to thank them for their considerable efforts this evening, will bear fruit and the quality of our listening will be improved tonight. I'm very happy that we will be listening to the conference uh, that we will hear from Laure Saint-Raymond on disorder, chance, and large numbers. Disorder is a subject of constant preoccupation for many of us for young parents in particular. Chance is an actor who plays a very large uh, role in our destinies. And even though small numbers is a very big concern for many of us at the end of a month, the large numbers are a source of fascination. So thank you to Laure Saint-Raymond to bring these three central topics of our existence together and to shed light on something where the future can be distinguished from the past. I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for these words of uh, welcome. I said that you could ask questions. I should say that this is uh, a conference which will take place in two languages. You'll hear the presentation in French, but you will also be able to hear a simultaneous interpretation in English. And you will have an opportunity to access the English interpretation of the conference live and for the questions and answers for the Q&A, don't 
hesitate to ask your questions either in English or in French. Again, we will pass uh, this on to the speaker. Before we have uh, the lecture, I'll ask another person to come up and introduce uh, the speaker, uh, Hugo de Mille Copain, who is from the University of Geneva and a professor at uh, the Scientific Institute in Paris. And he spends his time between Paris and Geneva. Good evening to you all. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, the mathematician of this evening, Laure Saint-Raymond. I would have liked her to be here with us uh, to give her lecture from here, but she is uh, doing this from her office this evening. Laure got a doctorate in 2000 under François Goltz. He was immediately recruited uh, by the CRNS. Uh, two years later, which was extraordinary, becomes professor at uh, the University of Paris 6. She was detached uh, to the ENS uh, school in Paris. She became uh, a professor at uh, MIT, Harvard, Princeton, all the prestigious universities in uh, the United States. Then she decided uh, to come back to Europe. This is uh, good for Europe. And uh, this time she's been appointed professor at uh, the ENS uh, in uh, Lyon. She talks about mathematical physics. And as its uh, name implies, uh, what they use is to use mathematical tools to study uh, phenomena that come uh, from uh, physics. She used uh, uh, partial equation theory in order to uh, look at uh, gas fluids. She looks at uh, the limits obtained from the Bosman equation in order to try and to develop other equations, uh, such as the Nagistor equation, which allows you to understand the behavior, uh, behavior of incompressible fluids. But she will speak much better than I can, and I'll give her the floor instantly. But before I do so, let me just say that uh, she has contributed to, to answer the sixth problem of the universe, which was asked first uh, time 120 years ago, when we had to try and understand the mathematical foundations of uh, physical theories. I think uh, that uh, she may hold this against me, but I've got uh, to try and engage in uh, mentioning the numerous uh, distinguishing uh, honors that she has received which rewards the extraordinary work uh, that she has accomplished. She was the fourth woman to receive uh, the Mathematical Society's award in uh, 88. Just so that you can see this uh, uh, in context, this is the most prestigious prize for young researchers. And I know that there are a lot of young people who are going to be listening to the presentation. We, the older uh, group, is when we talk of young people, it's people under 35. So if you want to try and get this prize, you've still got time ahead of you. She became an academician in uh, 2012. I won't mention all the other rewards that she has uh, received because I don't think this would do her justice. She has been also recognized on uh, numerous occasions, which shows the importance of scientific uh, cooperation, the importance of uh, giving time uh, for ideas to emerge, the importance of not uh, to enter into publish or perish uh, contradiction. And I think uh, that I would recommend to all the people who are following the lecture this evening uh, to go and see on the internet uh, uh, the science I dream of, uh, published by law. I think uh, this will give you a better idea than I can of uh, the pure approach she has adopted. And I think that everybody should uh, have this approach uh, to scientific research. She'll do this much more eloquently uh, that I can do. The science of which I dream. In a few words, uh, she's a model to be followed, and I would uh, encourage you to follow her. And I'm glad that the Wright Foundation that has given uh, a lot of young men and women an opportunity to be inspired uh, by Law's uh, lecture this evening, just as her colleague uh, is inspired by her work in numerous scientific symposia. Thank you very much, Hugo, for this very, very kind words. And thanks for the, to the Wright Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk to an audience that is slightly different as the one I'm talking to regularly. And also, thanks very much to uh, my colleague uh, from yesterday who was the first one to speak last night. And, uh, particularly because he introduced the topic I'm going to mention tonight. So this enables me to start uh, 
more directly into the heart of the matter. I'm going to talk about uh, thermodynamics uh, from a slightly different point of view. But what's a common ground between us is, well, I hope that you can see my screen. Let me check. Yeah. So, what I wanted to talk to you about was mentioned by Hugo in his presentation. It's the question of modeling uh, physical systems. There are several points of view, and what I'd like to do is uh, wondering whether these points of view are compatible or not. This is a topic that has been dealt with and discussed by the scientific community for about 150 years. Uh, it's the question and the topic of reversibility or irreversibility. It's an interesting topic for physics, but it has also been very often mentioned uh, in the history of science, in the philosophy of science. So I'd like to go back to this controversy that went on for about 150 years. And I think that today a compromise is possible between, between two points of view. The first point of view was the one that uh, had been mentioned by Etienne last night. Uh, a physical system can be described with Newton's laws. You use equations to describe the dynamic of a system. Here you have a system, an example, a famous example of billiard balls. I'm not very gifted for billiards, but uh, if you know all the positions of these balls and you know exactly the force with which you're going to um, have the first ball move, you will be able to determine the movement of this ball until the time it uh, uh, coincides with the second one. So you'll have a description of the whole system and in the case of a real billiard table, this evolution will stop at a certain point of, in time. But if you could imagine a perfect billiard table without uh, uh, any loss of energy, you could go on and on uh, all life uh, in large time, as we call it, with the billiard balls uh, alternatively being transported left and right, uh, uh, being reflected, etc., etc. As Etienne explained to you yesterday, these deterministic equations are equations where you know the state, the initial state, and therefore you can deduct uh, the uh, situation uh, later on. This is both true and wrong, true and false, because you can use as many billiard balls as you want, but you can take the example of a gas, for example, where these billiard balls would be the molecules in this gas. So there would be so many molecules that it would be very difficult to write this equation and to calculate the position of all the balls or molecules. And there is a second problem, the uncertainty. If one single minute mistake happens, uh, this uncertainty or this mistake or this error will uh, grow with time and uh, in the end the result will be completely uh, wrong. Thanks to Newton and these deterministic equations, uh, you can calculate and obtain precise solutions. Later on, uh, new ideas were invented with quantum theory, etc. But with Newton, you have a totally causal system f starting from a, an initial situation with equations that are sufficient to describe the situation of the balls on the billiard table at any point in time. Any movement is uh, totally reversible, which means that if I uh, go back on the velocity at some point in time, I can find out what was the initial position. 
This is precisely what I'm going to mention later on, this idea of reversibility. It is a property that is uh, uh, part and parcel of these uh, billiard games. But it's not obvious at all uh, in uh, experimental physics. So let me go to the second point of view that was slightly mentioned by Etienne at the end of his speech. It's a more statistical point of view. And I'll go back to this notion of statistics. Uh, it had been used by Boltzmann uh, two centuries after Newton to describe a gas which is nothing more than a collection of atoms and therefore corresponds very closely to a billiard uh, game, that Boltzmann described his, this gas with statistical means. He is going to write an equation where uh, the situation is irreversible. It was actually good news that you could write an equation about that because uh, it corresponds to our experience. If you draw a balloon, a red balloon, full with gas, and if you send the gas to a smaller balloon, uh, then you know exactly what's going to happen. The red balloon is going to lose a gas and the blue balloon will be full with gas until both will be will have more or less the same quantity of gas and then the blue balloon is not going to uh, send back gas into the red balloon there is in a way a direction uh, which is irreversible it's impossible to observe the contrary the bigger balloon is necessarily going to send gas into uh, the smaller. Boltzmann's equation was therefore a very good news because it enabled scientists to quantify and to express mathematically what you call the second principle of thermodynamics. In other words, this idea that mechanics is not reversible, at least at the scale where you can observe it. Any transformation of a gas takes place with an increase of a quantity which we call entropy. At the end of the 19th century, Boltzmann explained that this quantity of entropy was different from all physical quantities. Let's talk about energy. Energy is linked to the agitation of molecules, to temperature, to the agitation of particles. It's something that can be measured. You can also measure pressure. You can measure the velocity of uh, air flow. But entropy cannot be measured. There is no instrument enabling you to measure this uh, physical value. This is an idea that is central to this uh, presentation. Entropy is a statistical value and does not correspond to a uh, microscopic description of gas. Uh, tells you about the probability of a certain state. I'm not going into further details for now, but uh, I hope that you understand now the two points of view that are opposed to each other. A gas can be seen as a collection of atoms or a huge billiard ball, uh, a set of billiard balls, or you can consider it at a more statistical level and use Boltzmann's equation. But in that case, as Lo Schmidt uh, mentioned in 1876, uh, there is a paradox because he told Boltzmann uh, that his theory was completely impossible because his equation predicted that the evolution would be irreversible, whereas if you look at uh, Newton's equations, uh, his equations were reversible. So he took the example that I gave initially. If you invert the velocity of all molecules, there's no reason why you couldn't be able to go back to the initial state. Boltzmann replied to that with uh, a lot of uh, common sense, but uh, Nan said that was not really scientifically convincing, even though in his answer you could detect uh, preludes to a more valid answer. 
his answer was, if you think that uh, you can invert velocities, well, do so. Of course, there are several objections to that. The first uh, uh, being that you can't invert velocities of uh, all gas molecules. And the other objection is a uh, kind of uh, background objection. As Etienne mentioned yesterday, even if you could imagine to invert or go back on the velocity of atoms, if you did so, even though, you, even if you could, you might make a tiny mistake and due to this butterfly effect that we mentioned yesterday, you're never going to go back to the initial state. This was, of course, a rather flippant remark and a bit disappointing from a mathematical point of view, but at the same time, it was quite true, if you think of it. The system is extremely unstable, and therefore going back to an initial state is simply quasi-impossible. This is what I wanted to explain now. And that was precisely solved, or this paradox was uh, solved by Lanford 100 years uh, later, in 1973. So, coming closer to our present time. Lanford said that, as a matter of fact, there is no opposition between these two descriptions of the same system. Boltzmann's equation, which is irreversible, can indeed be obtained rigorously. There is a mathematical procedure for that. Hugo mentioned uh, going to the limit. This is not exactly the same thing, but in a way, this irreversible Boltzmann equation can be obtained if you take as a starting point classical dynamic of particles, which in itself is reversible and totally deterministic. Let me give you, therefore, two uh, ways or two keys to understand the situation. It may be or may sound abstract to you but it's necessary for you to have in your mind a kind of model to understand the way these two notions uh, are opposed to each other and then can be combined. And we're going to try and uh, uh, do some math uh, at a very easy level, and you'll see that uh, you'll be able to understand it fully. Two pieces of information are extremely important for you to understand this situation. There is no incompatibility between these two models. The first key to understand that is that Boltzmann's equation predicts a mean dynamic. If you start an initial configuration, you take Boltzmann's equation and you understand how the system is going to develop. Here, you recognize that the initial situation is known, but not completely, there is already a margin of error, and if you take an average over all the uh, reasonable initial configurations, you will find Boltzmann's equation. Boltzmann's dynamic, this is extremely important, and a Boltzmann equation, for example, is used to send uh, spatial ships into the uh, space and then back into the atmosphere, so it's very important. You have to understand that this equation is uh, not uh, the expression of one deterministic dynamic, but uh, the expression of an average or a mean dynamic. If you send a rocket into the space, you don't uh, try it on uh, uh, 50, 100,000 times. You try it once on the basis of solid calculations. The second key to understand the problem is that this average gives you a very good approximation of what's going to happen in reality. What's going to happen in reality is you take this average with Boltzmann's equation, you take the error, which is inversely proportionate to the number of particles. So the number of particles is uh, 
a problem if you take Newton's equation as a basic because uh, there is a very complicated system to start with. But if you want to use statistics on that, it, the more particles you take, the better it is for you. So if you change the paradigm, the more particles or the larger the number is, the better for you. If you have studied statistics, you know very well that uh, the fact that you have three children in a family doesn't mean that you're going to have uh, one and a half uh, uh, daughter and one and a half son. There is the more people, the more uh, molecules, uh, the better the average will be. Uh, The number of molecules in a room is about uh, 10 to the 14th, for example, in a room like the one I'm staying in. The average is going to give me a very good approximation, a probabilistic approximation, which means that the probability that something different happens is very small. Something different might happen. It could be, for example, that uh, something happens that is completely the contrary of what Boltzmann predicted, but the probability that this happens would be very small. So please keep in mind these two ideas. The first one is that equal Boltzmann's equation is not a deterministic equation, just like Newton's. And the second is that if you take a huge and complex system, the bigger the system is, the better the approximation. And then a small comment for those who know these notions. Entropy measures the lack of information or uh, the insufficient information of the system. At the beginning, you've been observing the system, so you know more or less uh, what it looks like. But the more time elapses, the, the more the uncertainty grows and uh, the more information you'll be losing. So I quite understand that uh, this is a bit complicated for you so far. In any case, the whole scientific community needed 150 years to understand or to be convinced by these ideas. I even read lately a few articles about this topic and some people are still not convinced. This is not the case for me, but I'm going to try and convince you now with a very simple example. This is not uh, the ring that Etienne was looking at. Uh, it's a, an even simpler system, an even simpler model, also with a ring. This is a kind of toy which is going to reproduce the main characteristics of a billiard table with transportations and collisions. With this system, I'm going to try and, and show you that at the microscopic level, there is a deterministic dynamic, just like Newton's laws. But on average, the, I obtain a rather Boltzmann-like dynamic. Let me try and be very simple so that nobody uh, uh, is uh, left out. This is the system. It's a kind of system of balls on a circle. With each time increment, particles will be transported in a certain direction. At time zero, the white particle is here at level one. At time two, it will be here and then on. At each time increment, there is a movement in a certain direction, just like uh, in a clock. That was the transportation part. Velocity simply is expressed with the lapse of time and these increments. Then I also needed collisions. Of course, if you take a ring or a circle like this, there's hardly going to be any collision. So let me introduce in this system a new obstacle. The obstacle will be these little green arrows that you see here. 
I have n numbers of markers which I'm going to spread at random on this ring. At each time increment there is a clockwise movement. But if the ball comes on a marker, it changes its color. So, for example, at time zero, this white ball will go to the second place and then it will be put uh, or uh, transported to the second place and again and again by changing color every time it goes over a marker. White, black, black, white, etc., etc. So you see that that kind of dynamic is totally deterministic. There is a rule, a rule of the game, and I can play the game as often as I want. And this is exactly what's going to happen. There is no transformation, no change in the rules. Let me try and make sure whether you've understood. I wanted to have you vote, but uh, without an audience it's rather difficult. So this is the first screen. This is the system at time zero with this configuration of white and black balls and the markers. Markers will not change during the whole game. And then let me try and implement the rule. This uh, ring is going to go round and round. At time one, the figure is still the same. At time two, there are a few changes. What is the right figure and what is the wrong one? Let me give you some help. The difference between these two figures is the following one. Here, between these two markers, green below, there is here one particle which is black and another one which is white. Can't be both at the same time, so one is correct and the other one is wrong. At time minus one, it had to be in a different from a, in a different color. Let me have a look at the situation just before. Since it went over a marker, it should have changed its color. So the second figure is indeed the correct one, and the first one is wrong. There are, in other words, no two choices. There is only one choice, one correct solution. It's totally deterministic. It's very important to uh, say that at the start. Other properties are also important and uh, completely consistent with Newton's law. The system is reversible, so you can implement uh, Loschmidt's algorithm to go back on velocity and go back to the initial position. So uh, to change velocity, you just move the circle in the opposite direction. Opposite direction, but impl implementing the same rules of the game and you can obtain exactly the same result as previously. So you can go back to the situation uh, one uh, increment before or two increments uh, earlier, etc. So you can go back even to the absolutely initial situation. These laws are extremely important. Determinism, reversibility, and another property that has also been mentioned by Etienne yesterday, but which is also extremely important for Hamiltonian systems. The fact that a recurrence principle that has been mentioned, and here it is expressed in very simple terms, periodicity. If all the balls turn round by a whole lap, you will have encountered the same number of markers, the same number of color changes will have happened, and therefore the initial situation will uh, happen again. After two complete laps, the situation will be exactly the same as uh, at the start. In other words, this system is extremely simple. I, it enables me to reproduce all the uh, laws and uh, situations that I need from Newton's model. What is interesting to say, what happens when you've got a large number of balls? If you look at the number of atoms or the number of molecules, if the number is very large, 
Now, if you've got a gas, it's not just one degree of uh, uh, freedom, which is going to be black or white ball. You've also got speed, uh, which is continuous. And you've got a position which is uh, continuous, and the system is much more complex. However, you'll see that just with uh, this uh, very small number of uh, um, parts of liberty, if you've got a lot of particles, you're going to, get to succeed in having a statistical description which will depend on the Boltzmann equation. So what I'm going to do, and what Etienne described yesterday, is that somewhere the uh, Newton's dynamic has an advantage. It is exact, uh, but uh, you cannot uh, dispute it. There is nothing uh, you can do with it. There are too many equations. It's too sensitive to the data, so you can't really use it. So my purpose, if I want to be able to do something with my system, I want to try and find a simpler system with number, uh, number of, uh, or ease, something which is easier to simulate, which is going to give me an, a good approximation of what I want to achieve. Because it doesn't matter to me whether I've got a particle which is going to be here or is going to be uh, somewhere else, or whether it's the same one. Uh, uh, we don't really matter which of the particles is what is the temperature in this room or what is the pressure or what is uh, the flow of air. I also want to look at uh, average quantities, but I don't have a lot of uh, uh, choices because uh, I've only got one degree of liberty per ball. And the only thing I can do in order to average out is to look at the degree of grayness. In order to do that, uh, for each uh, ball, I will associate a number, and it's going to be one if it's black, and it's going to be less or, or minus one if it is white. If all the balls are black, I do the average of all the colors, and I then get an average of one, which is one. If all my balls are white, I've got a, a minus one, and I'll get minus one. And if I've got some black, some white uh, balls, I'll get something between minus one and one. I think that uh, averaging uh, is not uh, difficult. Uh, even uh, children know how to do an average. And uh, to get uh, 8 out of 10, you, or t to get 10 out of 10, you must make no mistakes. If I want to get a mixture which is completely black, I've got to make sure I never make a mistake. All the balls have to be black. However, if I want to have a mixture which is more or less gray, then I've got lots of choices. I've got to have more or less the same number of white and black balls. And uh, from afar, it will show me something which is more or less gray. So, in the final analysis, the uh, disorder where you've got black and white mixed, uh, well, it is much more probable because there are lots of ways of achieving this uh, than to have everything which is in order. And that is going to be the key to understand the system. A state which has uh, a lot of uh, physical entropy is uh, something which is full of disorder and there are a lot of microscopic uh, differences. So a great state uh, with an average uh, which is uh, close to zero, that is going to be a state of disorder, a state where it's going to, to have a lot of microscopic variations. Now just to convince you of this, let me just to show you some numerical simulations. This uh, numerical simulation is uh, done with uh, 500 balls. If uh, you see that uh, the gray hasn't been standardized, you see uh, that uh, the number of balls are divided uh, by L. Here, all my balls are black here. Here, all my balls are white. And between the two, it means uh, that there is a mixture of black, uh, sorry, and white balls. And this is uh, the time axis. Now, here I've got all the balls which are black, and you've got time which is a zero, and it's black everywhere. And depending on the distribution of markers, and I've put uh, my uh, markers in randomly, I'm going to have a lot of different types of dynamism. Now, some of these can be picked out easily. For example, when there are no markers at all, which means that the particles are going to move, but they're never going to change color. They're going to stay black. And they're going to be on this particular line at the top. All the balls are black, and they remain uh, black. Then there is another one you can pick out, is when you've got one marker, 
all the balls are black and then you're going to get a, a ball which is going to go onto the marker then it's going to change color a second ball which is going to change color and then all the balls at some point uh, they're going to pass through the marker they're going to be white here you can see that they're all white and then they're going to go another marker in the other direction so the white uh, ball becomes a black ball and I will get to this point and if I've got two uh, markers I'm going to get this curve what happens when I have a uh, an average of n, you've got a, a greater trajectory, but there is a trend which you can pick out, which is quite distinguishable. It means that everything is to be found here on this dynamic, uh, this uh, black line that you can see here. Now. What is happening that everything is black and then all of a sudden everything is green. That is what we call relaxation. And then you have balance uh, where you've got as many black as uh, you have white balls. And then if you wait for a sufficient amount of time, you're going to reach this point where you have uh, one revolution, two revolutions, where everybody, all the balls are black, every ball is uh, white. And if you've got a very large space of time, you've got this periodicity. If you've got very, very, very large uh, periods, which you can never actually achieve when you're looking at a physical uh, system in reality, but what you will see is the beginning of this curve, and I can see that uh, all, all the balls come and aggregate around uh, this curve here. What I would uh, suggest we do now is to explain how we can uh, write this in mathematical terms. It's not complicated. You just uh, need uh, to... Uh, describe the system. You describe your system by showing the position of the markers, which are shown in green. I've got MI, which is a variable. One, if you don't have a marker between sides I and I plus one, and M uh, prime, if it's minus one, if there is a marker. Here you can see a marker here between position one and three, and two is going to be equal to minus one. M3 is there is no marker between position three and four, so M3 is going to be plus one. So when I give you these families of M, you've got the positions of my markers shown here. Now I also want to see the color of my balls, and I'm going to do as I was saying earlier on, you've got initial time, and I'm going to take one if uh, you are in uh, black on I, and uh, minus one if it is uh, white. The one and the minus one are not exchangeable. If I wanted to, to assign uh, minus one for the blacks and one uh, for the uh, black ones, it wouldn't change anything. So I can use this to describe all the colors of uh, my uh, balls at uh, position zero, and I can see the position exactly of my markers. And I can then uh, produce uh, an equation, an evolution uh, equation. It is sampled. The first uh, reason is if you look at uh, the discrete position, the you've got time zero, time one, time two, and these are full periods where you have uh, a time which is a continuum in physics. We're going to, get to replace uh, the finite uh, differences by derivatives. I haven't spoken about derivatives, uh, but we want to keep a simple equation. And the positions are discrete positions. So it's much uh, simpler than if you can uh, have uh, continuous uh, values for the positions. So what you end up with, I'm going to write my rule in this way. You can see that if I forget mi and I modify the rule, it tells me that uh, the uh, color at i is uh, uh, going to be the same as uh, the m plus 1. So you've got uh, the uh, color. So if there is no mi, this condition would just uh, tell me that I have changed by one step. And mi, what it tells me, if there is an obstacle or not, if there is no obstacle, m i is 1, so that is uh, just one turn. If m i is a minus 1, that means that there is an obstacle, and the color is uh, then changed, because if there was a color which was black, then by being minus 1, you're going to have 1 plus minus 1, it's going to become white. And if I have a white molecule, I've got minus a 1, and then it's going to give me plus 1, and that gives me a black molecule. So this equation gives me the transport and the collision factor. 
Now, you can see that this is an equation that I can uh, repeat. I also know that uh, I can write uh, the color at uh, time plus one, time plus three, just by repeating this relationship here. And I can also go backwards uh, because I can also look at uh, the uh, color at t minus uh, one with uh, the same uh, relationship. And everything is therefore reversible. And everything is determinist. So you can see that when I repeat this uh, relationship, the color of uh, I plus T is the color of uh, uh, that site at O plus the product of all these MIs are between the two. So I've got to see how many markers there are. I add them, how many markers there are between uh, I and uh, M plus, uh, MI plus one. So it is a recurrent uh, system. Of course, this is when a probability comes into play. You will probably remember that I've got average information about my markers, but I don't know exactly where they are. But let us suppose that the markers, uh, I, I don't know if there is a marker, so I need to determine whether there is a probability that there is a marker. If I'm going to replace something, it is the fact that I know MI, which is uh, determined. It is uh, given by the law of probabilities. And I'm going to say with the probability Q, I've got a marker. And with probability minus uh, one Q, there is no marker. Now, as my initial configuration is fixed and we've got time, which is uh, zero, uh, uh, then we have the balls, which are blacked. And I've got an exact formula for uh, an average. If my markers on each uh, site are, are given with this uh, probability of Q, and M1 uh, minus uh, Q, and there is no marker, and this is, or the sites are independent one of the other, I can calculate. And what I end up with is uh, with uh, this equation for an average of uh, grays. This is 1, because all my balls were black and very Soon, I go down towards zero here. So Q is between zero and one. And if it is greater than one and a half, uh, there's going to be oscillation. But I'm always going to end up uh, close to this axis. And even if I start with the uh, order where everything is black, at some point, everything is in disorder. I've got black, white, uh, all mixed up. And I'm going to get uh, an average of gray. So you can see in this little model, we have this uh, first property, which I mentioned earlier on, for the Boltzmann equation, which is that on average, you can have a lot of things uh, which are taking place. But on average, what I will see is a relaxation towards equilibrium, which is not reversible. You can't go uh, from zero to one. If I start from zero, zero I'll start uh, or I'll stay at zero. If I start anywhere else, I'll still move towards uh, zero. So it is not uh, reversible. And it is not surprising if you go into the street or if you know that uh, once uh, you'll turn left and once you'll turn right. And if you want to try and work out which are the times you've turned left or right, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to actually work that out. The same thing, you'll forget. An average is going to be more and more disordered and you will not be able to come backwards. Now there is a second question. That second question is to know if it is reasonable to look at just the average. You can say, well, on average, I'm not going to look at the average. I want to see whether there is a particular realization of my markers. What is happening? Am I going to be very far removed from the average? If I come back to the numerical experiment, if I take one type of marker, am I going to be here, which is close to the average, or am I going to be in the second position? So what interests us is the fluctuations around the average. How far will I be removed from the average behavior? And what we can see is that that behavior is typical. In other words, the more I have markers, the bigger the site, the bigger the approximation. That is, I'm not going to be far removed. Now, you can see in these numerical simulations, now, the number is uh, very large because you've got 500 sites. Here, I've got 2,000. And if I'd continued, if I'd had 6,000, uh, the uh, lines would be much closer together. And uh, the greater number of sites, uh, the closer I am to the average. If I've got uh, 
I will find the average here and the error, which is shown by this uh, variant. I don't have a calculator here, but this uh, variant is inversely uh, proportionate uh, to the number of particles uh, which you have in, in your system. So this tells you that in a gas, if you've got a lot of atoms, Although the large number of atoms is an enemy to a certain extent, if you want to follow each of the atoms because there are just too many, you can't do it. However, if you want a statistical description, it is uh, advantageous because the more atoms, the more you will be closer to the average. So that is the theory. That is a simple model which shows you what happens to all these molecules. If you did this in real life, it would be more difficult, of course. But let me just uh, try and convince you that it uh, remains a fundamental and important problem, and it is a subject uh, uh, for our current research. But it is also important for applications as well. So let me just uh, do a bit of a plug for statistical physics. Uh, you can look at this from a mathematician's or physician's uh, uh, point of view. You can see that mathematics can provide answers to many problems uh, which are quite uh, difficult conceptually. I also want to show you that there are many examples that can be taken with uh, current problems uh, which uh, need to be looked at from a statistical point of view. Now, fundamental physics. This is a problem that I have worked a lot and I continue to work a lot as well. It is almost the same, same, same thing as the small model I showed you, but what I have here is real particles in this case, uh, where you've got uh, um, hard uh, particles uh, which uh, move in a particular direction, and sometimes they uh, meet a friend and uh, then uh, they collide uh, like billiard balls. And so they're going to have a reflection uh, uh, or movement. So you've got lots of little billiard balls, and what is interesting is to try and understand what is happening with regard to the dynamics of the system. Now, it's a very good system, such as the one Etienne mentioned. It is a system which is perfectly reversible. I can return the uh, dynamism. It is a system which shows uh, the uh, principle of recurrence uh, to the power of two. You can uh, come back at your initial uh, situation if you wait for a very, very, very longer time, depending on the number of particles. And it is also a chaotic uh, system because if I change the pressure of the particles, then uh, you're going to have a collision not between these two but with other uh, two uh, particles. So you're going to have different speeds and you're not going to have the same concatenation of collisions. And uh, there is going to, go to lead you to something very different. You know you saw a video yesterday with the billiard ball, so it is very sensitive uh, to initial conditions. So I've got a system which is inextricable from a point of view classical mechanics. And what I wanted to say here is that from a statistical physics point of view, it is a system which can tell us a lot of things. The first thing we can say, and this is the point I was trying to make earlier on, and you have a theorem which reconciles the two approaches of physics, the Lanford theorem it is called, statistical physics and classical statistics. And in a short time, we know that uh, almost uh, certainly what you're going to observe resembles the, uh, the dynamics predicted by Boltzmann. Now, recently we've done a lot of uh, work on this, and uh, what is uh, rather sad with the Lanford uh, theorem, it works for a short period of time very, very small, the time just to return or reverse the equilibrium. And uh, then you can get uh, it possible, or it is possible to extend the time just by a little bit. Then you want to try and uh, get an average. And you have to estimate uh, the variables I mentioned uh, earlier on. So what are the size of the fluctuations? For those of you who are familiar with probability, now there is a certain limitation. And what I can tell you is that recently we are capable to show that we have uh, a theorem on limitation, uh, which uh, brings us close to Lanford's uh, theory. And we can see how the different trajectories, the real trajectories, uh, fluctuate around uh, the average. So the size of that fluctuation and the probability of uh, that fluctuation taking place. 
And uh, what we've also seen, this is also very important. The Boltzmann equation, if you have uh, a loss of information, uh, you cannot reverse it because uh, you've lost too much information. So with the, the uh, limit or central limitation, what you're compensating uh, or the fluctuations compensate uh, of uh, the dissipation of entropy. So if you look at uh, the fluctuations, uh, you have to look at all those fluctuations, not the average of the fluctuations, and it's essential that you understand this in order to comprehend uh, the concept where has all the information disappeared and the information has disappeared in the fluctuation. There is another question which I will come back uh, to a bit later on. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I will come back to this because it is a very important question. This is what can happen. Is it, uh, or is there any form of dynamics which is that uh, not uh, um, predicted by Boltzmann? You know, the little uh, balloon which uh, uh, becomes uh, smaller and smaller because uh, it sends air into the red balloon. It can happen. It happens very, very rarely and nobody has actually observed it. But what we are saying is that it is possible to estimate the probability uh, that a rare event can take place. This is something which is going to be exponentially small with the number of particles, with n, which is uh, very large, which is uh, why you rarely see it. But it's going to be very important in certain applications to know how you can estimate these very rare events. This is something which we can do for this uh, system I'm describing. Now, these are fundamental physical problems with um, uh, very hard uh, spheres. Now, molecules uh, do not react in the same way as these hard uh, spheres. And you need to have much more uh, complex uh, models, which are much closer to uh, uh, physics uh, than the CAC model. But I think it is an ultra-simplified uh, system which allows you to understand fundamental problems uh, But statistical physics also addresses these issues uh, looking at real physics problems. One of the, these uh, problems, and uh, it is a vast problem, that problem is the problem of turbulence. Here you can see numerical simulations of a fluid. And what you can see that uh, this uh, is something which is a, a, a lot of uh, flows taking place. And if you try to understand all these different flows, just as it was impossible to track all the atoms, it's going to be almost impossible to see all these uh, vortexes. Now, what we're going to do is to take an average, we're going to take a, uh, an average of vortexes, and uh, there is a, a statistical description, which is the Kolmogorov spectrum. Now, I think that one of the questions uh, that uh, still has not been addressed is, can I start with uh, fluid mechanical equations, and uh, there, is a, there are a lot of them, and to find that statistic? Now, we have uh, made a lot of progress in this area, and we can say that uh, you can construct uh, fluid uh, equations uh, with uh, different types of behaviors with uh, different types of vortex. This is uh, perhaps very spectacular, but we don't know how to describe the statistics of uh, these uh, rare occurrences or singularities. And this is a real problem of statistical physics, is to understand the link uh, between the fluid model, which is like the Newton equation at uh, the microscopic uh, level, and a description which is statistical, which allows you to give you uh, to give a description of the structure. And then there is another aspect, which is the modelization of climate. You can start with an extremely simple uh, uh, example. I showed you how you can describe this simply with a CAC. Then you have the harder spheres because you've got more liberty, greater time, etc. 
and uh, there you end up uh, with a non-linear model. And after that, you increase the complexity because I start from a model where the basic equation is a, a fluid equation, uh, where it is uh, a bit further away from Newton's model. And then you have another model at a greater scale, which is even more complex because there are more parameters, more scales involved. Just think of uh, climate. Uh, there is the atmosphere, the amount of CO2, the number of gases, lots of physical problems. There are lots of different scales. You've got the scale of atoms, the scale of uh, uh, vortexes. Uh, then uh, you've got uh, the tsunami uh, effect and that scale. So there are lots of different scales, lots of physical uh, properties, lots of uh, parameters. So the... Uh, more you try to go to a determinist model, it becomes more and more difficult to do so. On the other hand, if you want to do something statistically, you can do it uh, because you've got more degrees of freedom. So I think that this is something that is extremely important. You have to be able to understand the climate uh, from a statistical physics point of view. What people do, and I think what is better known, is the global trend which is the average uh, trend if we're talking about uh, the warming of the atmosphere. You've got an increase in temperature, which is on the increase. It is an average uh, dynamic uh, curve. But to know that on average, uh, uh, for all the parameters, for all the seasons over a number of years, uh, temperature increases, uh, but there are other aspects. What is going to happen to us, for example? Etienne spoke about uh, hurricanes. So you want to be able to know what is the frequency of heat waves or what is the, the frequency of hurricanes. And these are events which are perhaps rare events. If you go a bit further into statistical theory, and if you don't look just at the average, but all the things that deviate from the average, all the things that fluctuate, you will end up perhaps not being able to predict exactly what's going to happen, but uh, you will see the frequency or the probability that you will have a heat wave or a hurricane. That's the first point. Or perhaps a, a very hot uh, summer. That's going to be important. You'll get that probability. Another important point is that when you start to understand these uh, big variations, and I'll finish on that, it, if you know the path of deviation, the deviations don't take place often, but when they do, they are going to be reproduced dynamically, which is important because you're going to be able to find precursors. And if you can see that your curve is starting to move in a particular direction, perhaps that is a sign of a precursor of a big event about to take place, rare as it may be. So you see that, that uh, the field of statistics is enormous. Perhaps uh, Martin will talk tomorrow about uh, statistics uh, in a more dynamic manner, perhaps, than I've been able to do today. But I think uh, that uh, it is a, a really a, a very exciting field of study, and I hope I have uh, whet your appetite to learn more. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Laure Saint-Raymond, for this uh, fascinating and playful trip into mathematics. We have about half an hour for a question and answer se session. Hugo de Milcopin is with us, but also Elise Raphael is with us. She is also a member of the mathematics section uh, in the University of Geneva here. And she'll uh, give us all the questions that have been asked uh, online. To leave you some time to write your own questions, let me uh, start by asking the first question. Coming back to these two worlds, the world of uh, billiard balls and uh, balloons uh, described by Boltzmann's equation, let's try and imagine that you add a great number of new billiard balls. You have two extremes. On the one hand, billiard balls and the world of Boltzmann, but is there a frontier between both? How can you go from one world to the next one? Well, the principle is that there is no frontier. Lanford theorem tells you precisely that there is no frontier between the two. The more you add particles, the more you cl get closer to Boltzmann's equation. If there are hardly any particles, the uh, 1 over n value gives you hardly any information. But the more 
particles you have, the more your billiard balls are numerous, uh, the more Boltzmann's uh, prediction is going to be close, and the the more you'll be able to be sh nearly sure that uh, uh, Boltzmann's prediction is true. Transition is very unclear. All trajectories will converge towards uh, the average, but that is an effect of large numbers. By preparing this evening, I noticed that what you particularly like is the transformation of physics into axioms. I'm a physicist by training. I think that every physical system is uh, demonstrable. Now, don't you think there is a paradox between my point of view and yours? Well, I don't think so. We all know that physics has uh, evolved with discoveries questioning the uh, previously used models. We know, for example, that Newton's physics uh, does not take into account uh, quantum effects or the effects of general relativity. We also know that if you want to describe physics, what we feel or what you, we notice or observe about physics uh, is difficult. The more you can observe, the more you can you describe, the more you can see that uh, the previous model is insufficient. What I'm interested in is to know why the first models that were proposed uh, were actually not as bad as that. If you want to describe the movement of an apple falling, can be uh, described with a quantum theory, but it's no use to go into that kind of details. You simply need to apply Newton's law. There is no contradiction between all these models. We have different models because we have been discovering new things with time, and we can better understand a great, a more important number of, of uh, elements. And that doesn't mean that the previous model is no longer valid. What I'm interested in is to understand how these models are articulated or go hand in hand with each other. The first question, we'll go back to rare events later, but the, is the uh, event or a phenomenon of um, tsunamis uh, something uh, that uh, is linked to Boltzmann's equations? Yes, indeed. Uh, many people are working on that kind of uh, problems with uh, calculations of probabilities. Once more, let me recall that it's important to understand these deviation paths. These rare events hardly happen, but whenever they happen, they happen in the same way. So we can always describe the precursors, and people who are working out numerical codes cannot tell you that... Um, it's impossible to, to work with these precursors. It's very important to understand physics, but also for numerical events, events that are so rare that if you don't impl implement uh, the knowledge you have, you can't possibly find a solution. Now, I have another question about Holzman uh, equation and this will be also a question for you. You explained at the beginning that uh, these theories were not accepted. He even committed suicide because he didn't accept the fact that his equation was not recognized. This shows that it's very difficult to have people change their minds. Do you think that this is still the case today in mathematics? Well, I don't know exactly. It's in a way linked to the question that was raised yesterday. Which are the discoveries that really changed the world? There are very few and far between. There is a kind of uh, Brownian movement for the evolution of science as well. There are stops and goes. Things are changing very uh, slowly, and uh, big revolutions are very rare indeed. Indeed, Boltzmann was uh, really a precursor himself. He was really the creator of uh, statistical physics. Planck was the one who 
accepted really his uh, teachings. He decided, as Etienne told us yesterday, that uh, scientists would no longer be uh, all-knowing. Obviously, Maxwell's and Boltzmann's works started the ball rolling, and then uh, Einstein went on and uh, revolutionized the world. But indeed, uh, the expansion of probability theory happened in the 20th century. 20th century. Yes, indeed. Uh, probability theory was uh, based on uh, very few axioms to start with. So uh, there was a kind of motivation coming from the world of physics uh, that helped probability to uh, be uh, more used. There was, in a, in, a world, in a word, the need from physics to explain the world through probabilities. Develop axioms for physics. You said there, is no, there are no axioms. It's just an observation. The axiom, the basic axiom of physics is that you have to observe the reality. So this is also changing with time. There was a need for probabilists to... Uh, base themselves on axioms. That was the case with Kolmogorov. And everything accelerated from then on. And nowadays, uh, probabilities are to be found everywhere in many mathematical areas. Uh, uh, some people tell, that I am, tell me that I am a probabilistic, but I'm sure that Lohr is as well, and Martin is going to explain to you probability, and Mr. Smirnov is going to mention probability on Friday. This is uh, present everywhere. Indeed, it didn't happen overnight. Elise, is there another question online? Other um, listeners wanted to ask questions about entropy. This lack of information that you mentioned, uh, does entropy measure it? And then what about Shannon's entropy, about the measurement of information? Well, a first observation to start with. The entropy I mentioned is not the same one as uh, Etienne's entropy yesterday. It's more linked to uh, Shannon's entropy and the question of information. From the point of view of physics, this has been written actually on uh, Boltzmann's tomb. Uh, entropy is expressed by the logarithmic function of a same macroscopic state at a microscopic level. The macroscopic level is the gray that I mentioned earlier the level of gray of the system I explained. If you, I take the example when it's all black, I only have one state. All particles have to be black. The entropy of this very ordered state is very small. And then if I know that my system is gray, it means that I have many, many different microscopic ways of understanding the system. My only constraint is that, on average, uh, the result would be zero. But the number of, of possibilities is huge. Entropy measures the number of microscopic uh, realizations, the number of details that I can't observe, but which analyze a same microscopic state. If I take Boltzmann's description, the average description, I forget all these details. I started with a state that was well known, but then, with time, I turned to a more macroscopic level, and I have, of course, less information about the microscopic details. Entropy is precisely that, and it's linked to Shannon's entropy. So from the point of view uh, of a uh, functional approach, Boltzmann's entropy is quite close to Shannon's entropy. It's basically the same idea. So this is a very important value, but with a very uh, specific status. It's a different status than other physical values. Energy, for example, or mass can be measured, but entropy can't be measured. 
the entropy of a particle can't be measured because I don't have the information about it. You need a huge system if uh, the idea of entropy is to be understood. It's very important to understand that even if you learn thermodynamics, I never understood anything about thermodynamics because uh, teaching is uh, microscopic, but if you manipulate entropy just like energy, you get uh, quite a different status. I looked at the presentation you made in front of the French Academy uh, and you mentioned this video, I looked at it, and you say in this presentation that in science you should take your time. When I prepare these evenings, I read uh, writers like Euclid, and uh, he said that even if you're a king or a queen, you shouldn't be in a hurry if you want to study math. Let me turn to this idea of gestation, of, of uh, progressive creation of new ideas and the time it needs. You are very young, but you're already a professor. So how did you manage? How did you have this uh, genius idea? I'm rather impatient by nature, but I learned to, le to, to wait and to be patient. It's a very good school, actually. Indeed, one shouldn't be discouraged uh, at the first failure. This is valid for all uh, realms of research. There are more cases of failure than of success. And that kind of work is uh, needs a lot of uh, temperament and resilience. At the same time, when you find something, when you find a new idea, even uh, if it takes you five or ten years, uh, it's very uh, gratifying. Probably more gratifying than if you find small ideas every month. Of course, our time is a long time and doesn't correspond to our political time, for example. But um, the time scales we're talking about in mathematics is not compatible with the time scale that we are being imposed with uh, as far as the financing of research is concerned. Obviously, we're working at the long in the long term. And particularly if you work on that kind of topics, it's impredictable. You don't know exactly what's going to happen if you're going to find out something. Well, if you don't like that kind of things, you just have to change your career. Well, indeed, yes. I think Law explained the situation as it is. One thing is true. The rhythm is in mathematics is more or less the same one as in other sciences. But in other sciences, you know that you need time. You know that you have to test things. But some people may have the idea that mathematici mathematicians just uh, uh, come up with new equations every day. And they tend to forget something that is very valid for all kinds of sciences, but even more so in mathematics. But you need time to make mistakes. Uh, I started learning that you should never make mistakes, but my way of doing is making mistakes and correcting myself. But it takes time. So you have to accept that and don't accelerate. Otherwise, uh, you never, you are never led to the right solution. Law was mentioning financing. Uh, this goes against this idea because financing systems impose you to come up with a result on uh, next week or next month. But that is just impossible. You can't work that way. Great discoveries were always discoveries that were due to chance. Elise, do you have a question online? Well. You mentioned statistics and uh, what can be applied, what statistics can be applied to. The question of um, the audience is, 
Could it help us understand black holes or finance or modeling of uh, uh, dissemination of uh, epidemics, etc., etc.? What are the ways of implementing these uh, statistical approaches? Well, f statistical physics could be valid for many of these uh, applications indeed. But you need to understand underlying phenomena. For gas physics, for example, you have Newton's mechanics that help us explain the interaction of two billiard balls. You have an equation to understand their interaction, and then you can add on that statistical calculations. But at a microscopic level, I can understand the way the system changes. And what is missing for now, for example, if you're talking about epidemiology, what we miss is the microscopic uh, situation. If two people meet, for example, how does the virus go from one person to the next at a microscopic level? We don't understand that. So we need this understanding at a microscopic level in biology or physics. The problem doesn't come from probability or statistics. Of course, the more complex the problem is, the more difficult it is to, under, to find the right uh, tools in mathematics. But the first step is understanding the objects on which you are going to apply your statistical calculations. For, but it's particularly valid for biology. There are many interfaces between mathematics and biology. Historically speaking, uh, the interface between mathematics and physics has always existed, but the interface between mathematics and biology is something much more recent, uh, about 20 years ago. But it's exploding. It's booming. However, you need to start modeling first. And the more complex the situations are, uh, the more complicated the whole thing is. But the problem is not linked with statistics. It's uh, linked to the understanding of the mechanics first. Statistical physics has a power to concentrate on this loss of information, but a controlled loss of information. So for example, you can interest, uh, you focus your interest on the number of black particles. That kind of uh, controlled uh, uh, approach is something that is interesting for all areas and for all branches. Statistics are being used in all sorts of realms nowadays. That is true. But I am going to paraphrase law. Very often, you have very few data for certain systems. But if n is small, the predictive character of your work, of a, your statistical work, is not going to be very valid. So you don't have enough data to start with. You have no idea what are the basic mechanisms, which are important to describe to you how things are going to evolve. So it's important to understand these mechanisms first. And then, this is precisely the case with the epidemics nowadays, Sometimes you're disappointed with the answer because, once again, you're going to describe a typical behavior telling you the probability of having such or such a result. But psychologically speaking, people have great difficulties in accepting this. Describing the rate of probability, the probability of something happening, is very difficult to understand. It is not the same thing as having a clear-cut answer, this is going to happen. If you go beyond hard sciences, then you have this psychological blockage. Let me go back to this idea of uh, communication in mathematics. Yes, indeed, it's uh, complex, but some people communicate around all these topics. One uh, of the most famous examples is Cédric Villani. We all know about him or know him. By preparing this uh, evening, I came across several papers, including one I wrote on field medals, in particular about Martin Herrer. 
And there was a professor from the University of Neuchâtel who said that mathematicians, mathematicians don't communicate enough. It's our fault. We should uh, go out further to the audience, just like Cédric Villani does. Precisely to explain uh, to the audience that uh, probability doesn't mean either black or white. Well, communicating about math is not the same profession. Doing research on the one hand and communicating on the other hand is not the same thing. It doesn't mean that researchers should uh, stay among themselves and never talk to the general public. That's not what I mean. But indeed, the uh, qualities you have to uh, be communicative are not the same ones as the ones you need to be a researcher. Well, you need imagination, you need patience, uh, you need to be a bookworm also, you need to understand uh, how others have been thinking before you. Uh, these are the qualities uh, of a researcher, but it's not the same thing as explaining to the general public. And I think it's one of the big difficulties of uh, uh, university teaching. Uh, being a good researcher doesn't mean that you're a good teacher. Obviously, in the end, you can explain what you're doing, but it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. The responsibility of researchers is indeed to make their research accessible to a certain degree and explain what its scope is. But it maybe there is indeed a category of um, people who should be in between and uh, play a role of a bridge between both communities. In the end, Sometimes the researchers are so much involved with their own work that they have difficulties explaining their work to the general public. It's not necessarily the same people who should do both things, research on the one hand and communication on the other. Indeed, this deserves a deep reflection. You need to think hard about it and if I want to give a message to the young people, it's that, well, it's absolutely fascinating to work in mathematics. Well, during your presentation in front of the French Academy, you also said, science is part and parcel of culture. We scientists have the ways of making dreams come true. That's what you said in 2013. Now, what are the means available to do that? Well, it's a complicated, probably have no clear-cut answer there. But when I see the reaction of um, everybody around me when I say that I'm a mathematician, Either people tell you, oh, I loved math when I was uh, young, and the other kind of people tell you, oh, I hated maths. There is no in-between. It's either one or the other. I like to say that uh, the kind of maths you do at uh, secondary level is uh, just the basics. You learn methods of calculations and of thinking, but you don't really grasp what it actually means. You don't grasp mathematics as a language. For me, it's an art. And it should be presented that way, I think. You've spoken about uh, the role of uh, women. You're the only woman in this uh, symposium, and uh, you're the only woman who's uh, received the Fields Medal. Um, how can you explain this? Uh, is this a world uh, just full of men? How can you get more women uh, to develop uh, in this area? Why do you ask that this, uh, question? Why do you ask me this question? Why do you ask my male colleagues? Well, I <laughs> ask this because you're a woman, and I'm sure that you must have thought about this. I'm sure that people have uh, asked you this question. Well, uh, perhaps I'll ask Martin that question tomorrow because uh, he was uh, from the same uh, group as Miriam. 
Now, this is something which I find is very complicated. Uh, there are lots of uh, prejudices, and sometimes it's uh, difficult to formalize them. It's a bit like uh, a, a science. How do you, where you have a vague representation, and how do we transform this uh, into something more specific? So I cannot give you a, a precise list of uh, biases. I don't think that uh, women are less uh, um, gifted than men. Perhaps uh, they are less uh, attracted to sciences. But on the basis of my experience, I don't think that uh, there was uh, any negative uh, bias uh, when I uh, participated in competitive examinations. I can't really say much, but I can say that all these methods with quotas, etc., I think we should forget those. I think that uh, women should feel that they are in their rightful place, and quotas will do the opposite. To come back what you were saying uh, to about uh, mathematics uh, and art, or as an art, where do you see art in mathematics? Do you see that there is a link here? That was one of the questions uh, that we were asked online. I think my initial reaction, and I said this earlier on, I think that to be a researcher, and uh, this is not just for mathematics, it's to be active and creative. If you're speaking uh, about uh, uh, mathematics to somebody, they'll talk to you about uh, being an engineer, but they won't speak about creativity. But research is uh, based on creativity. That's the primary quality we need to find in somebody. So I think uh, that because of its essence, it is closer to an art. And I think that the second thing uh, that is important, mathematics is a language uh, which may seem to be very difficult to attain. But it is a language. It is something which allows you to formalize uh, things. Now, we spoke about physics, uh, physical systems. Now, when, when I wrote that equation on the CAC system, then you could have a long description. I'm going to turn right. I'm going to go past a marker. But a small one-line equation does all that. So it is a language which is uh, very powerful and also very aesthetic. I think that we can, uh, if you look at a, a paper, it's like uh, seeing uh, uh, a picture. Some can be uh, beautiful, others can be uh, uh, very impressive, but which may not be beautiful or attractive. So there is an aesthetic element which is very, very strongly represented. So if uh, you see uh, a notion of what is uh, technical, what is, uh, what is beautiful, I think that we are close to an art. I think that there is no creativity without aesthetics. And I think that that is a problem with sciences and mathematics in general with regard uh, to uh, dissemination. People like to read because they read. So they like sport because they uh, look at it. Uh, to be able to uh, experience that aesthetics, you have to practice it. And I don't think we give enough opportunity. We're starting to do this with young people. And I think that there are certain things that are being developed. But uh, amongst adults, uh, it is totally missing. We don't uh, allow people to exercise this uh, possibility. And I'm sure, I don't know, if you're uh, given uh, problems to solve which are at your level, whether they're physics, bio and biology, you'll see how interesting they are. This is something that stimulates people. And we see this in all the kind of games like Sudoku. People are interested uh, in uh, games which are perhaps uh, less enriching uh, uh, intellectually than physics or uh, mathematics. So I think it is the practice uh, that uh, we don't manage to attract people to. Well, we're coming uh, to the end of this evening. I've got a question for you, Laurent Saramon. I'm coming back to uh, what uh, my colleague, who's going uh, to be um, saying on Thursday. You say, I see physics like a source of uh, mathematical problems to be solved, which allow you, uh, which require you to develop mathematical tools to solve them. Now, I don't know if you followed uh, this uh, question or this uh, lecture yesterday. And uh, if you look at uh, the cover of Science et Vie in 1999, now we need to find out whether we're discovering uh, mathematics or do we build it or construct it with intelligence. I'll answer this in the same way as the preceding question. 
is it a realistic uh, painting that you're looking at or is it a surrealistic? You know, there are all kinds of uh, tastes. Uh, now, I'm interested in mathematics inspired by physics because somehow in my way of thinking, in my way of imagining things, I see reality in this way. It gives me ideas. But there are other mathematicians for whom mathematics is something very abstract uh, because they've got very different representations in their head than I have in mine. So perhaps uh, that there are as many types of uh, mathematics as there are mathematicians. Well, thank you very much, Lord Saint-Raymond. We're going to close uh, this uh, evening. Uh, the symposium will continue tomorrow. Martin Herrera will be our speaker. And I think we will also show you that on Thursday, Alain Conn will be speaking, and we've got Stanislas Smirnov on Friday. When I say here, I mean online. I'd like to thank all of you who have participated in the organization, including the Wright Foundation and all the team, the University of Geneva that has provided us with this facility, Isabelle for the questions, Hugo for the introduction. Thank you also for the interpreters. I can't see them, but I'd like to thank them on your behalf and all the persons who have participated in the organization of this symposium. One last point. There is no light show, no son et lumière in the Parc des Bastions. We will do that next year at a date which will be communicated to you. But there is going to be an exhibition on the visualization of mathematics uh, at uh, the University of Geneva. It has been placed online. It should have been here in the building of uh, the university. But please uh, look at uh, this online at colloc.ch. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. See you tomorrow. <laughs>